Good afternoon. My name is Duncan Ross. I come from a company called Teradata. Teradata produces large data warehouses. I like doing stuff on data that's in data warehouses that's interesting to me. Anyway, I don't really mind whether it's interesting to other people. It's interesting to me. That's what matters. Now, I could have chosen to tell you all about data warehouse structures because it's really, really interesting, or maybe something about Java and C++ mechanisms of getting data out of there. Instead, I thought, why not do something that's actually important in the world? Um, and what I'm going to talk about follows on very closely from that rather fantastic uh, presentation we just had. Um, when you go to big data conferences, the, uh, for a start, it's an interesting big data conference here because uh, there have only been two mentions of, of Hadoop so far, and both of them were made in passing. We've got people here who are more interested in doing stuff with the results than in necessarily the technology that underlies them. That's really brilliant. But we just heard some things that touch on some important things that we haven't heard about. Crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing using the wisdom of people, in this case a, a competition, to find the best solutions. Open data. Whilst we've been here in this room, Francis Maud has just released the white paper on open data um, for the British government. And the British government has actually been leading the way on open data. Um, and now they seem to have got over the idea to the government that the PDF is not actually an open data format. Um, and so hopefully data will be readable as well as available. Um, but there are other things going on as well. Uh, consumer data lockers were touched on. A consumer data locker is the idea of saying, whose data is this anyway? We always assume as companies, when we create this data, that the data belongs to us. So in the case of Orange France there, um, the data, it's our data. Well, it's also the data of the people making the calls. And giving those people the control of understanding what that data might mean, so that's another aspect of big data, sometimes referred to as the quantified self-movement. Um, gamification we haven't touched on. Let's just say it's fun. Uh, but what I'm really interested in is how you can bring these things together into something that's starting to be called data philanthropy. But I, I do think about how would professions be improved if you took the word data and put them in front of it? This has happened a few times. We have the concept of data journalism. Has anyone come across data journalism? Uh, yeah, I know you have it, because I'll tell you about it. Uh, <laughs> data journalism is something that's being led by the New York Times and by The Guardian in the UK. There's a, a journalist called Simon Rogers who works for the UK. And his concept was, rather than the traditional approach of journalism, which is journalist gets hunch, uh, starts building a story in his mind, goes and looks for confirmationary evidence, let's start with the evidence and see what stories it contains. And he um, highlighted a very important thing about big data. I'm going to have to start on the actual slide sometime soon, by the way, otherwise I'm going to run out of time. But he came across a really good point about big data. Big data is not an absolute term. Big data doesn't mean I have 52 petabytes of data. Okay, that is not what big data means. Big data is relative to where you are at the moment. Big data is the volume of data and the complexity of data that pushes you beyond your comfort zone. In the case of The Guardian, it was when they got their first data from WikiLeaks. And their first data from WikiLeaks was big data because they couldn't get it into Microsoft Excel. <laughs> now, for most of us, that's probably not a, an example of big data, but for them it was. The next step came when they got the, um, the uh, Iraq, um, all the data from the Iraq war. They started analyzing that. But they've done some fantastic things around that. And it's based around this concept of, if I took journalism, and actually thought what it would mean to do data science and big data activities on it by putting data in front of it, would I get a better thing? What about data politics? Wouldn't it be nice if politicians based policies on evidence rather than on doctrine? You know, we know politicians are very good at making sure that any evidence they find happens to accidentally coincide with their doctrine. Um, what other things could we do? And some guys in America came up with this idea of data philanthropy. What would the world be like if we started thinking about more things we could do with our data? So I work for a large organization. And in large organization, corporate ethics is often phrased in this way. Basically, don't get caught. The second phase is, if you're going to do it, don't put it in an email. Because uh, you do know, by the way, that when you delete those emails, they don't actually disappear. If anyone didn't know that, you should go and listen to the Leverson Inquiry, where it's quite evident that this doesn't happen. And then the third stage is if, if you're going to do it and you've accidentally put it in an email, don't get caught. Okay. 
The second aspect of corporate ethics is often around this idea of um, doing what I call arbitrary good. And this is um, this picture. Uh, does anyone in the room have a guess about why I've got a picture of a kid on a bike here? The reason I put this here is because um, Teradata has a, a corporate um, good, uh, what do they call it? Um, Teradata Cares. Teradata Cares, thank you. Teradata Cares basically um, raise money for charity and they put the people of Teradata to work doing things for the benefit of the community. And in their wisdom, they have decided that the right thing to do with a bunch of people who are IT experts and database experts is to get them building bikes for disadvantaged kids. But possibly not bikes made by a bunch of people who are used to doing data warehouses. <laughs> Certainly, I, I'd be suspicious about giving one of these bikes to my kids, because frankly, my physical mechanical skills are more than limited. So this is what I mean by arbitrary good. I work for a while for Experian. Experian think that building bikes is too much for their workforce of, uh, of IT experts. And they think that they're much better spent digging ditches and painting walls. Is there a way of getting them to do that on behalf of organizations who might benefit from it? Because I, I'm telling you something, I'm not good at building bikes, and I'm not very particularly brilliant at painting walls or digging ditches. I'm certainly not as good as digging ditches as a mechanical digger is. So why do you want to use my time, my valuable time, doing something I'm not good at, supposedly for the benefit of community? So is there something more? And a guy called Jake Forway, who used to work for the New York Times, made this comment. He said, why are some of the brightest brains of our generation spending their lives trying to decrease churn rates by 0.2%? Does that seem the best use of their expertise and their resources? So UN Global Pulse. UN Global Pulse is a direct initiative of the UN General Secretary. And their motto, you can see it there, harvesting innovation to protect vulnerable. And a lot of this came out of the idea of what is the way that disasters present themselves to the world? How do you know there is a famine in a country or an outbreak of disease in a country? Well, usually, if you're the UN, the way you find it out is suddenly 150,000 people cross a border. Okay? And you've now got refugee camps. You've got to get aid there. It's a disaster because it happened suddenly. You were unprepared for it. Things are now happening. You have to react to it. You do a big um, publicity drive. You get people to donate money. Countries promise money that they may or may not choose to pay eventually. Um, it's a problem that is caused because of lack of data. And what they discovered is that the data was often already there. It just wasn't being brought together, and it wasn't being interpreted correctly. So take, for example, the outbreak of a disease. If you're a GP in a rural area, and some of your village start getting a particular disease, <coughs> typically in Africa, they report that. There are mechanisms for reporting that information. What doesn't always happen is that that gets put together with other information. So if it's just five people presenting with a disease in my village, it may just be something local. It may not be an issue. If it's five people from my village, ten people from the next village, three people from the village after that, we might have an epidemic in my family. And what UN Global Pulse seeks to do is, can we take those signals, can we integrate them and derive information that allows us to predict things happening more rapidly, so that rather than 100,000 people crossing the border, we're able to treat them where they are and actually solve the problem or minimize the, the problem that's caused. And we can see just some of the examples, of, and that was just one specific example, but if you look up here at some of the research projects that are on the website at the moment, so looking at big data for development, looking for the impact of unemployment by looking at Twitter and Facebook feeds, um, looking at food security issues, all of these are things where big data sources and analysis can come together to provide real difference to the world. You know, in reality, you know, we are small cogs and machines. It's pretty hard for us as individuals to participate in this in a particularly significant way. We can lobby our politicians and say we think it's a good thing. Um, if you're in a company like Orange, obviously you can actually do things yourself around this. And what Orange is doing is fantastic. It is really brilliant. But not all of us are in control of large volumes of data like that. You know, Teradata isn't. You know, we provide data warehouses for our customers, but that's not our data. It's their data. But there are smaller initiatives that we could take part in. So the second organization that I want to talk to you about is an organization called DataKind. At the moment, it's a US-only organization, but we're working hard to bring it over to Europe. And the concept of DataKind is that they want to help what they call not-for-profits in America, what we might call charities in Europe. They want to help charities who have data or who have access to open data to further their goals. Most charities don't have a lot of capacity in this area. I know this, I was a, a chair of a, a childcare charity here in the UK. And 
We didn't have the capacity to do this kind of stuff. We didn't have the expertise to do this kind of stuff. We were struggling to actually collate spreadsheets together to understand you know, when money was coming and going out of the organization, which actually partly explained why we had financial problems. Um, but DataKind is there to actually do that, to get people like yourselves to go in with ideas about what you could prove, what you could test, what you could find out for that charity. And the way they work is, is straightforward. They do things called data dives. A data dive is a one or two day event um, where people come in, they have access to the data, the charity can talk to them about what they think the, their needs are. The data is analyzed, researched, sometimes bits of code are built, sometimes applications are built, all these prototype applications. I'd be generous if I could say people build applications in days. And the results are then used to further that organization's uh, activities, providing direct benefit back to the community, using skills from big data, from big organizations. I think this is a fantastic thing, absolutely fantastic. Um, and what it does is it turns the, the ethics concept on its head from the way that it's normally presented. It's not saying that it's, you know, that you should do bad things, obviously not. Google said, you know, do no evil. Fine, do no evil. Well, actually, Google said do no evil as long as you don't tell senior management. It doesn't really matter if you're accidentally slurping data from everyone's Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> you know, these things happen. Um, doing no evil is good. Well, no, doing no evil is passive. Okay, no. Doing good is good. Doing no evil is important, but a much bigger challenge to us as individuals is to actively <coughs> do good. Turn the ethics on your head. I don't want to say that ethics, corporate ethics is, it is enough just to do no wrong. It is not enough. You need to do good. And that's what data philanthropy is about. It's about taking our skills, committing ourselves that we will participate positively in our community using the skills we have. And that was my time. Thank you very much for listening.